Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students and welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Professor Vageshwari Deswal, Professor of Law at Delhi University. We are doing a course on Bharatiya Nyay Sahita 2023, the Substantive Criminal Law. Today we will be discussing lesson 11 which is titled Offences Against Woman and Child. Before we begin, let us try and understand how the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita defines the terms woman and child. Section 2, Clause 3 of the BNS defines child to mean any person below the age of 18 years. Students, this is a change from the definition of child as was given in the earlier Indian Penal Code. IPC did not use the term child, instead it used the term minor and then there were different age fixed for majority. Say if we talked about kidnapping for boys, the age of majority for the purpose of kidnapping was 16 years whereas for girls it was 18 years. For a minor married wife, the age of consent was 15 years whereas for all other girls, the age of consent was 18 years. So now there is this definition which has been introduced in section 2 clause 3 and now every child irrespective of the sex of the child whether it is a male child, a female child or a trans child any person below the age of 18 years is now covered under the term child. Then how do we interpret the term woman? So section 2 Clause 35 defines a woman to mean a female human being of any age. So here again there is no subjectivity involved. We cannot say that she is an infant, she is a child or she is an old woman. A woman means a female human being of any age, whether it's a 6 month old baby, whether it's an 80 year old woman. So it has to be a female human being irrespective of her age and that would be a woman. So we will try to understand in this lesson what are the acts which have been expressly declared to be offences against women and children under the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita. So the objective of this lesson would be to know the laws relating to various crimes relating to marriage such as cruelty, dowry death, bigamy, undergoing fraudulent marriage ceremony, enticing a married woman. Of these crimes, some are gender specific in the sense that the victim can only be a woman, whereas there are a couple of crimes which are gender neutral in the sense that the victim can be either a man as well as a woman and the perpetrator could also be either a man or a woman. Then we will try and understand what constitutes the offence of causing miscarriage. See, miscarriage is a very unfortunate event for any woman. But what makes it a crime? So we will try and understand that and thereafter we will try and understand what are the various offences that can be committed against children within the scope of Bharatiya Nyay Sahita 2023. So first of all, we'll talk about a provision which has been now reintroduced in the BNS in the form of section 85 and 86, whereas earlier in IPC, this is a provo provision which was notorious and it was section 498A of the IPC. Now this was a provision which was introduced in the Indian Penal Code in the year 1983 by way of a criminal laws amendment 
Why? Because it was felt that so many women, they were being subjected to cruelty in the domestic sphere within their matrimonial homes. So we needed a special provision to safeguard them against various kinds of cruelty that would be inflicted on them, whether that was physical cruelty, mental cruelty, whether it was related to demand for dowry or otherwise. But see, because of the institution of marriage in our country, wherein girls, they are supposed to leave the family of their birth and go and settle in the husband's family. So that is an environment which is alien to her. Okay. So she has to make a new beginning there. She has to adjust herself there. Moreover, in our setup where we look for a taller, elder, more educated and a more well settled boy as compared to the woman, what happens? The girl finds herself at the receiving end whenever there is any kind of a clash or a dispute. So how to safeguard the interests of women in such a setting? So that was the reason why in 1983, taking cue from the rising incidents of cruelty that were happening against women, uh, single provision section 498A was introduced in the Indian Penal Code and now we have retained it in the BNS in the form of two provisions. The single provision has been split into two parts, section 85 and section 86. So what does section 85 say? It says, husband or relative of husband of a woman subjecting her to cruelty. So what is the crux of the offences? Cruelty. Now how is cruelty defined? Cruelty has been defined under section 86. Who can be the perpetrator of the crime of cruelty? It says husband or relative of husband. So husband is whom she is married to Sometimes what would happen that there would be people who would be uh, having a kind of a standing in the society as if this man is married to the woman. So they are for a long time in a relationship and when he holds out to the society as husband and wife. See here we are not talking about live-in relationships. Here we are talking about the status when that is projected to the society that this man is the husband of the woman. So when they are married or sometimes even though the ceremonies they might not have been properly performed but because they have been living together for a long time and they have been presenting themselves to the society as being spouses married to each other then this law would cover those husbands also. Then it says relative of husband. So relative of husband would be any person who is related to the husband by marriage, adoption, uh, it could be by blood, it could be uh, either ways but it could be either by blood, marriage or by adoption. So these three categories would be relatives of husband. So what does the provision say? Whoever being the husband or the relative of the husband of a woman subjects such woman to cruelty shall be punished with imprisonment for a term which may extend to three years and shall also be liable to fine. So what is required is that cruelty should be inflicted on a woman and the perpetrator could be either the husband or relative of the husband. See relatives of the wife who are related to the husband through the wife they would not be considered to be relatives of the husband for the purposes of this provision. Now, how do we interpret the term cruelty? Section 86 defines cruelty. It says for the purposes of section 85, cruelty means any willful conduct. So the conduct should be willful, done voluntarily, which is of such a nature as is likely to drive the woman to commit suicide. Okay, so it is so grave, it is so serious that the woman is compelled to commit suicide owing to this kind of a cruelty which is being inflicted on her or to cause grave injury or danger to life, limb or health whether mental or physical of the woman. So here you can see that the scope of this term cruelty is very broad. 
we are not talking only about physical cruelty, even mental cruelty. See a woman, she is being taunted continuously for not being able to bear children, for not bringing adequate dowry, for not knowing how to cook properly. It could be for any reason. Maybe she is not as good looking as the husband wanted her to be and she is constantly being taunted for these things or uh, constantly some uh, kind of snide remarks or comments are being thrown at her due to which the woman, she is in a state of constant distress. Stress. So, it could be either physical cruelty, it could be mental cruelty, but then what is required is that it should be of such a nature as is likely to drive the woman to commit suicide or to cause a grave injury or danger to life, limb or health. It should be so grave as to cause some kind of a grave injury to the mental health of the woman. Only then would it amount to a crime to be covered under section 85 of the BNS or what could also amount to cruelty under section 86 is harassment of the woman where such harassment is with a view to coercing her or any person related to her. So, it could be with a view to compel this woman or her family members, any of her relatives to meet any unlawful demand. See, the demand should be unlawful nature, something which the woman, she is not bound to provide to her in-laws or something which her uh, family members or anyone, they don't owe to her uh, in-laws, but still when they have make, made a demand for that, so it gives the nature of unlawful demand to that kind of a demand. So, the unlawful demand could be for any property, it could be movable property, it could be immovable property or valuable security. So, anything which is capable of being translated into monetary terms or is on account of failure by her or any person related to her to meet such demand. So, either when they are compelling her to fulfill that demand or suppose they had agreed to fulfill that demand and if later on they are not able to fulfill that demand, if she is being harassed with an objective to coerce her, to compel her or her relatives, sometimes what happens that there is a demand from a relative that you have to do us a favor. But the woman is she is being harassed continuously that that relative of yours is not doing this favor to us. So, any kind of a harassment which is being meted out to the woman in order to either coerce her or her family members or relatives to meet any kind of an unlawful demand that would amount to cruelty under this. So, you see it could be related to dowry, it could even be unrelated to dowry. So, students now we will talk about the use and abuse of section 85. You must have heard about how section 498A is being misused by disgruntled wives to take revenge against their in-laws or to teach a lesson to their husbands. In fact, some sections of the media have gone to the extent of reporting of saying that section 498A IPC is something which was meant to be a watchdog, but over time it has transformed into a bloodhound. So, why is this kind of an image of section 498A coming before the society? And the reason is, see 498A, the old provision and now section 85 if we talk about. So, this talks about cruelty against a married woman by her husband or in-laws. So, incidents of cruelty, they take place within the matrimonial home. Who are the witnesses in such cases? The family members of the husband, the husband himself or his family members. Even otherwise, see the family relations, the ties, they are so close that it is highly improbable that one family member will testify against another one who is his own family member. In such cases, usually even neighbors do not come to know about it and even if they come to know about it, they usually try to maintain a distance. Nobody wants to meddle in anyone else's private affair. See, whatever happens within the four walls of a home, there is this private affair syndrome which affects a lot of us due to which what happens? We often turn a blind eye even if we see a woman being abused by her husband. What we feel is that no, it is something between the husband and wife. 
and that is what patriarchy has taught us to do because we as women also even if we are being beaten by our husbands we take it and we wouldn't want anyone uh, any outsider to intervene so that is the reason why for the longest period of time our laws also did not intervene in the private sphere because it was felt that it is something which is between the husband and his wife but then given the institution of our marriage the way it has been designed when a woman she is at the receiving end of cruelty and harassment obviously the law needed to do something and that is why in 1983 we enacted this provision but then again what happened that even if a complaint was registered still what would happen it was very difficult to prove cruelty now see something which has taken place within the four walls of the house no outside witnesses okay no evidences in such cases how do you prove it second thing what happens that there is a cruelty there is some fight a quarrel when the case goes to the police when the case goes before the courts usually there is an out of court settlement okay the parties they also want to reconcile okay there is an out of court settlement after which the women they refuse to cooperate with the prosecution they will not go to the courts or they will turn hostile and in such cases again the accused would not be convicted so most of the time the accused they are not convicted they are let off why because there is either lack of evidence there is an absence of witnesses and there is a very very high rate of attrition why because of the compromise that is entered into between the parties outside the courts so in such cases what happens number of cases that are registered are so large in number there might be a very few number of fake cases also because sometimes what happens the lawyers and all they also compel the family members of the girl to also invoke this kind of a serious provision serious charges against the family members of the boy so that they would look for a compromise so this is in way uh, sometimes they use it as an arm twisting tactic to ensure that the boy's side also comes on to the table and he agrees to some kind of a compromise so what happens because of so many reasons there is a very very low rate of conviction in such cases but then that doesn't mean that all the cases were fake from the very inception okay because of so many reasons i told you okay high rate of attrition high rate of compromises between the parties lack of evidence absence of witnesses due to which there is a very very low rate of conviction in such cases but then what is the impression that is going on that this is a provision which is being misused by women and it is some kind of a legal terrorism which women have unleashed upon their husbands and in laws so that is not something which is true then there have been many judgments in this regard one of the leading judgments is arnesh kumar versus state of bihar this is a 2014 judgment by the supreme court of india in which the supreme court directed police to follow parameters required for arrest under section 41 of the crpc the old crpc in which is now the bharatiya nagrik suraksha sanhita and not to make arrests in routine manner in section 498a or other cognizable offenses why because this is a provision which is meant to be used as a shield and not as a sword this is something which was again reiterated in satender kumar antil versus cbi so as to put a check on police officers that arrests in cases allegation of 498a are leveled against family members then arrests are not to be conducted in a routine manner they have to follow the parameters that have been already laid down under the law then there was a leading judgment lalita kumari versus government of up 2013 in which the courts had uh, noted down those cases wherein uh, the police could take some time before registration of an fir and cases of marital discord is one of the category of those cases in which police officers have some sort of a latitude or discretion that is they can refuse to register an fir till the time they don't conduct an initial preliminary inquiry after which they would have to register an fir in case there is some substance in the allegations 
And then again these preliminary inquiries they have to be conducted in a very small time frame. It is not that you can just delay the proceedings by taking a long time for conducting these preliminary inquiries. But then this is also meant to serve as a check on making unnecessary arrests in cases of section 498A. Then there was this judgment Rajesh Sharma versus state of UP. Now this was a very controversial judgment because the Supreme Court had suggested the constitution of certain well family welfare committees which would look into allegations of 498A and it was only when those committees would recommend that FIRs could be registered in such cases. But fortunately it was overruled in 2018 in Social Action Forum for Manav Adhikar versus Union of India Ministry of Law and Justice because they said that we cannot dilute the provisions of section 498A by introducing provisions of family welfare committees and all these in the requirements of registration of FIR before 498A. After this provision, next we will talk about dowry death. Students, the crime of cruelty against married women was introduced in the Indian Penal Code in the year 1983. But despite that, it was seen that the number of women getting killed in the matrimonial home was steadily rising and that is why the legislature had to make an intervention and in the year 1986, one new provision was introduced in the Indian Penal Code in the form of section 304B which has now been retained in the BNS in the form of section 80 and that is dowry death. See what does the law say? It says where the death of a woman is caused by any burns or bodily injury or occurs otherwise <clears throat> than under normal circumstances within 7 years of her marriage and it is shown that soon before her death she was subjected to cruelty or harassment by her husband or any relative of her husband for or in connection with any demand for dowry, such death shall be called dowry death and such husband or relative shall be deemed to have caused her death. So what does this provision say? It says death of a woman. First requirement for dowry death is that the woman should have died. In case there is an attempt to kill her but the woman does not die, it is something which will not be covered under section 80. For this what is required is death of a woman and that is why it is something which is also commonly referred to as constructive homicide. See homicide means killing of a human being by another human being. And constructive homicide is that when, when you have not actually killed a human being but you have constructed such circumstances that the person was compelled to take his or her own life. So either if a woman is driven to suicide on account of cruelty on demands of dowry or even if she is killed, so whether she is killed, whether she is compelled to take away her own life, both those cases would be covered under section 80 which is dowry death. But what is required is that death of a woman and it should be caused by any burns or bodily injury or occur, occurs otherwise than under normal circumstances. So first requirement is death is death and second is non-natural death. So the woman should have died of non-natural causes. In case it is a natural death, it is not something that would be covered under section 80. So the cause of death could be burns, it could be bodily injury or it could be anything which is not a normal cause of death. So it would be covered under section 80. Within 7 years of her marriage. See here again, if the death takes place after 7 years of marriage and even if it is a non-natural death but if it takes place after 7 years of marriage, it could be covered under any other provision but it would not be covered under section 80. So here the requirement is death, non-natural death, 7 years, within 7 years of marriage. And the date of marriage, it, the date of solemnize of the solemnization of the marriage ceremonies, from that time 7 years they are to be calculated and it is shown that soon before her death 
she was subjected to cruelty or harassment so what is to be proven is that she was subjected to cruelty or harassment and this cruelty or harassment should have been subjected on her by her husband or any relative of her husband again the relative of husband should be someone who is related to the husband by blood marriage or by adoption okay for or in connection with any demand for dowry so what is required is that the woman should have died a non natural death within 7 years of her marriage and she should have been subjected to cruelty or harassment by her husband or relative of her husband in connection with demand for dowry see if it is in on account of some other reason that would not amount to dowry death see there was a case in which the husband would be constantly passing remarks at his wife because he was not happy with the wife's cooking the wife got fed up of that and she went and committed suicide now that would not be covered under dowry death why because although there was harassment of the woman of the wife but that harassment was not on account of dowry that harassment was on account of some other thing so that would not be covered under section 80 so what is required is that the harassment should be by husband or relative and it should be in relation to demand for dowry and another thing what is required here is that soon before her death see this harassment or cruelty it should be closely related to the death of the woman okay the harassment that the woman was subjected to or the cruelty that was inflicted on her it must be related to dowry demand and second thing it should have a close or a live link between the death of the woman and uh, the cruelty or harassment there should be a proximity a close nexus between the cruelty that was inflicted suppose there was a comment relating to dowry some one year back after that everything was forgotten suddenly the wife goes and commits suicide it would not be covered under 304b uh, or section 80 in order to be covered under section 80 what is required is that the cruelty the harassment which had that kind of an effect on the minds of the woman that she was compelled to take away her own life or that she was killed was on account of the demand of dowry and it should be i mean closely linked it should be totally interrelated and it should be on account of that that the woman was compelled to take such a step only then would it be covered under dowry death so if such a thing happens then the death shall be called dowry death and such husband or relative shall be deemed to have caused her death so students hear this word deemed it is very very important why because see whenever we talk about criminal law in criminal law prosecutions responsibility is throughout on the prosecution and the prosecution has to prove the guilt of the accused person beyond reasonable doubt but what section 80 does is introduce a deeming provision which is supported by a, a provision in the indian evidence act which is now the bharatiya sakshya adhiniyam now what it says it raises a presumption as to dowry death what it says is that in case all these conditions as laid down under section 80 are satisfied that is in case there is a death of a woman the death is non natural death it takes place within 7 years of her marriage it can be proven that soon before her death she was subjected to cruelty or harassment and the cruelty or harassment was in relation to demand for dowry so if the prosecution can establish these things see death of a woman it is something which can be proven objectively 7 years within 7 years again there it can be proven very very objectively now whether there is a close relationship between the cruelty or harassment which was on account of demand for dowry and the death of woman that is again something which the prosecution would have to establish whether the death was non natural death again see many times what happens if the in laws have killed the woman they would hurriedly cremate her they would hurriedly dispose of the dead body because otherwise what would happen it would be sent for autopsy and it would be determined whether it was a nat- natural death or a non natural death so we've got leading judgments in which the courts have ruled that whenever a woman's body is disposed of in unholy haste by her in law so it will give rise to a presumption that maybe the death was non natural so all these things they have to be proven by the prosecution and if the prosecution can establish all these things then the law presumes that it is a case of dowry death and now 
the onerous burden which usually prosecution has to discharge it shifts on to the accused person and now the accused has to establish before the courts why he should not be held guilty for the crime of dowry death so now the accused would have to establish that no it was a natural death or there was no dowry demand and all these things he would have to then rebut all the proofs or the uh, whatever was already proven by the prosecution now the burden would be on the defense to establish his innocence so that is how 304b now section 80 dowry death works here again what does the explanation to this provision say it says for the purposes of the subsection dowry shall have the same meaning as in section 2 of the dowry prohibition act and see what does the punishment that has been prescribed it says whoever commits dowry death shall be punished with imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than seven years and which may extend to imprisonment for life so you see it is a case of killing but death penalty has not been prescribed because it was felt that see what happens in case of dowry death there is so much of media reporting and there is so much sympathy for the lost life that sometimes judges they might also be influenced and there might be so much pressure on the judiciary to hand over the death penalty to the one who is accused of dowry death see in India we have retained the death penalty but it is to be awarded only in rarest of rare cases so that is a test which we apply whenever death penalty has been prescribed for any crime so when there is a charge of dowry death I mean the prosecution can also impose a charge of murder on the accused and in such cases if it can be established that it is a case of murder then it would be open for the judiciary to grant a death penalty subject to that rarest of rare doctrine but in case we were to put it in the cases of dowry death if we were to put it in section 80 then sometimes there could be a pressure on the judges to award that kind of a penalty so that is why as a safeguard death penalty has not been prescribed in dowry death cases but again something which is very different from what usually the law was in 1986 when this provision was initially introduced was the provision for a minimum sentence see ordinarily in criminal law what would happen the legislature would prescribe a maximum punishment and then it would be open for the judges that if they wanted they could award a lesser sentence also depending upon the mitigating factors of any case like for that which we apply the test of criminal as well as the test of the crime so then we would see if there were reasons why the accused should be given a lesser sentence the accused could be set off with, uh, let off with a lesser sentence also but in cases of dowry death acknowledging that this is such a heinous crime when a woman she is killed on when such circumstances are created against her that she is compelled to take away her own life and the perpetrator is none other than the one whom she has trusted with her life and everything her own husband so in such cases the punishment that would be prescribed was a minimum punishment and now what happens is that in case dowry death can be established the accused is to be sentenced to a minimum of seven years the courts they do not have a discretion to award a sentence which would be less than seven years they would award a minimum sentence of seven years which may extend to imprisonment for life depending upon the aggravating circumstances of the case but in no case would the judges be able to award a sentence of less than seven years after talking about the crime of cruelty and dowry death let us move on to other provisions dealing with crimes against women and that is section 81 cohabitation caused by man deceitfully inducing belief of lawful marriage so for that what is required is that cohabitation should have taken place it should who can be the perpetrator man and what he should have practiced is deceit by this deceit the man has induced belief of a lawful marriage that is the marriage has not lawfully been solemnized that is either the ceremonies have not been solemnized or the man he projects himself as being an unmarried man whereas actually if he is married then the second marriage would be a void marriage 
but the woman doesn't know that so the man in order to cohabit with the woman he deceitfully induces in that woman that we are lawfully married so any man who does such an act would be punishable under section 81 what does the law say every man who by deceit by any false means causes any woman who is not lawfully married to him not lawfully married to him that is either the ceremonies have not been uh, performed properly or where the man was already married so it's a bigamous marriage so then in such cases every man who by deceit causes any woman who is not lawfully married to him to believe that she is lawfully married to him and to cohabit or have sexual intercourse with him and that belief shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. So you see what are the requirements for invoking section 81? The man should have deceitfully induced belief of a lawful marriage and on account of that belief the woman consents to either cohabit with him or to have a physical intimacy with him. In such cases again there is a punishment which can go up to 10 years. See this is a provision which is also covered under provision of rape section 63 clause 4 that is when the woman consents to have sex with a man because she believes that he is a man to whom she is lawfully married whereas the man knows that he is not the lawful husband. So that would be something which would be covered there also and it can be covered under section 81 also. Then section 82 which deals with the crime of bigamy that is marrying during the lifetime of another spouse. See bigamy is by and large prohibited under the law but personal laws they govern us in matters of marriage, divorce, succession and inheritance. So for Hindus bigamy is illegal, for most of the religions bigamy is illegal but for Muslims bigamy is not illegal so that is one area where the secular law will not prevail over Muslims. So here it says marrying again during lifetime of husband or wife. So what this means is that bigamy is a crime which can be committed by either the man or by the woman because it says lifetime of husband or wife. So bigamy can be committed by a woman if she remarries while her first husband is already alive or it can be committed by a man who marries while his wife is still alive. So what the law says whoever having a husband or wife living marries here it is required marriage. Marriage requires proper solemnization of marriage as per the ceremonies and all the other requirements. So whoever having a husband or wife living marries in any case in which such marriage is void by reason of its taking place during the life of such husband or wife. See if a person already has a spouse living so except Islam where a man can keep four wives at a time so except Islam in any case a person remarries the marriage would be void. Okay, it would be void ab initio shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to seven years and shall also be liable to fine. So you see bigamy is punishable with seven years imprisonment. Now what is the exception? This subsection does not extend to any person whose marriage with such husband or wife has been declared void by a court of competent jurisdiction. See if the first marriage was already declared as void then in such cases the spouses they are free to go ahead and remarry that is when only the first marriage was declared to be void and that too by a court of competent jurisdiction nor to any person who contracts a marriage during the life of former husband or wife if such husband or wife at the time of subsequent marriage shall have been continually absent from such person for the space of seven years. See if a person is not heard of for a period of seven years so there is the presumption of civil death but then again it is something which the courts have to certify and shall not have been heard of by such person as being alive 
within that time provided the person contracting such subsequent marriage again. See what the law says that one has to come to the court with clean hands. So even if you were not aware of your spouse's being in existence uh, for seven years, the spouse did not contact you for a period of seven years, it was not heard of as being alive. But did you disclose this fact of your marriage not having dissolved to the person whom you were planning to marry subsequently? So that is one requirement here. What does the law say? Provided the person contracting such subsequent marriage shall before such marriage takes place inform the person with whom such marriage is contracted of the real state of fact so far as the same are within his or her knowledge. So before marriage the person is supposed to inform the other party that I was earlier married. I have no intent to uh, commit any kind of a fraud or practice any deceit on you. I was married but for seven years continuously I have no clue. I have not been in touch with my spouse and my spouse is not heard of as being alive. Only in such cases would this operate as a defense against the charge of bigamy. So here to pr uh, prove charges of bigamy what is required is that second marriage should have been contracted. See if a man is married to a woman and he is in a living relationship with another woman that does not constitute bigamy for the purpose of criminal law prosecution. For proving bigamy what is required is that second marriage should have taken place while the first marriage was valid. That is it was not declared void, void and the first spouse was already living. Next is marriage ceremony fraudulently gone through without lawful marriage. In section 81 we read when the person undergoes a marriage ceremony fraudulent with intent to cohabit or have sexual intercourse with a woman. Here it is talking about just undergoing fraudulent ceremonies of marriage. What it says whoever dishonestly or with a fraudulent intention goes through the ceremony of being married knowing that he is not thereby lawfully married. Students again it is talking about whoever. So it is a crime which can be committed by both man as well as woman. Although the pronoun that has been used later on is pronoun he but the pronoun he is used to cover all pronouns he, she, they, them, it is all covered under this. So that is why this is a gender neutral crime in the sense that the perpetrator could be a man, it could be a woman also. What it says, whoever dishonestly, but what is the gist of the offenses? The crime should have been committed either with a dishonest intention or with a fraudulent intention. And with such kind of an intention, if the accused goes through the ceremony of being married knowing that he is not thereby lawfully married. So the accused knows that the person is not lawfully married still he undergoes he or she undergoes those ceremonies. So in such cases the punishment would be imprisonment for either description for a term which may extend to seven years and shall also be liable to fine. Next comes section 84 which is enticing or taking away or detaining with criminal intent a married woman. See this is slightly contentious provision. Adultery has been decriminalized by the Supreme Court judgment in Joseph Schein case. But this is a provision which is quite similar to that provision. So this has been retained. This is again something which is quite archaic, quite colonial in the sense that a woman's sexuality is considered to be the absolute monopoly of the husband herein also and the woman is robbed of any agency of her own. See what does the law say is enticing or taking away or detaining with criminal intent a married woman. See when we talk about the terms enticing, when we talk about taking, we usually use these terms in context of minor children who are below 18 years of age but here there is no age bar, it is talking about married woman. What does the law say? Whoever takes or entices away any woman who is and whom he knows or has reason to believe to be the wife of any other man. So when a man knows that this woman is already married to another man and he entices or takes her away 
with intent that she may have illicit intercourse with any person. So, any intercourse outside marriage, it has been defined as an illicit intercourse here with any person, whether it is with that person himself or with any other person or conceals or detains with that intent any such woman shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to two years or with fine or with both. Now, this is a provision wherein prosecution can be initiated by the husband irrespective of the consent of the woman involved. See, is this not a crime wherein the man should be absolved of his guilt in case there was a consent on part of the woman? Because here we are talking about adult women. We are not talking about minors or children below the age of 18 years for which the age of consent has already been fixed by the law. We already have POXO also. We already have this age of consent which has been determined in the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita also. But still we have retained this provision wherein the husband can prosecute a man in case that man entices or takes away his wife with a criminal intention. But such a right has not been given to wives whose husbands might be enticed by any other woman. So again, I think if this provision would be challenged, maybe it would be also struck down the way Joseph Shine had struck down the earlier provision on adultery, which was section 497 of the IPC. Moving on, section 87. It talks about kidnapping, abducting or inducing woman to compel her marriage. What it says, whoever kidnaps or abducts any woman with intent that she may be compelled or knowing it to be likely that she will be compelled. So, this is talking about both intention as well as knowledge to marry any person against her will or in order that she may be forced or seduced to illicit intercourse or knowing it to be likely that she will be forced or seduced to illicit intercourse shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. And whoever by means of criminal intimidation as defined in the Sahita or abuse of authority or any other method of compulsion induces any woman to go from any place with intent that she may be or knowing that it is likely that she will be forced or seduced to illicit intercourse with another person shall also be punished as aforesaid. So, this is a specific provision that safeguards kidnapping or abduction of women which would induce uh, them or either compel them, force them into marriages against their will or which would seduce them for purposes of illicit intercourse. Now coming to offence against unborn children that is causing miscarriage. Section 88, what it says, this is similar to section 312 of the IPC. Now this has been retained in BNS in the form of section 88. What it says, whoever voluntarily causes a woman with a child to miscarry. So, what is required is that there should be a woman with child, a woman who is pregnant if she is caused to miscarry by any person, whoever it could be a man, it could be a woman, it could be anyone, but whoever voluntarily causes a woman with child to miscarry. So, when it says voluntarily, it excludes accidental acts. Okay? It has to be a deliberate and a voluntary act. So, whoever voluntarily causes a woman with a child to miscarry shall, if such miscarriage be not caused in good faith for the purpose of saving the life of woman. So, it is permissible only when it is to be for saving the life of the woman and it should not be caused in bad faith. So, it should be in good faith. If it is caused in good faith for saving the life of the woman, then it is not a crime under IPC. How we determine the good faiths? That is by exercise of due care and precaution. If they arrived at the conclusion that see, this is a step that has to be taken in order to save the life of the pregnant woman. Only in such cases it is permitted, not otherwise. Otherwise, it would be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to three years or with fine or with both. And if the woman be quick with child, quick with child means where the pregnancy is in a advanced stage. That is where the fetus has already started moving, some sort of a movement. So, that usually happens after four and a half or five months of pregnancy. 
So, in such cases where the pregnancy is in an advanced stage, then the punishment would be imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 7 years and shall also be liable to fine. Explanation to the section says, a woman who causes herself to miscarry is within the meaning of this section. See, this is contrary to the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act 1971. As per that law, a woman has the freedom to decide whether she wants to have the baby or not and she is required to take consultation up to 20 weeks from one doctor, up to 24 weeks of pregnancy from two doctors and there also the primary concern is the health of the woman. If the doctors advise her only then she can go ahead with the miscarriage but the concern is only for the health and safety of the woman. So when we have retained this explanation a woman who causes herself to miscarry is within the meaning of this section. So this is something which is in conflict with a woman's right to her bodily autonomy which has been guaranteed under article 21 of the constitution of India. Section 89 causing miscarriage without woman's consent. What does it say? Whoever commits the offence under section 88 without the consent of the woman, whether the woman is quick with child or not, shall be punished with imprisonment for life or with imprisonment for either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. Next is section 90 which talks about death caused by act done with intent to cause marriage, miscarriage. That is the intention was to cause miscarriage. Intention was not to cause death. But in case death results from that, then what would happen? The law says whoever with intent to cause the miscarriage of a woman with child does any act which causes the death of such woman shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. Where the act referred to in subsection 1 is done without the consent of the woman, then punishment could be till life. Then it is not essential to this offence that the offender should know that the act is likely to cause death. See, even if the offender was not aware that the act which he done with which he did with the intent to induce miscarriage could cause the death of the woman. What is required is that if an accused has done the act with the intent to induce miscarriage, but the act in itself was such that it led to the death of the woman, then section 90 can be invoked here. Section 91, it says, act done with intent to prevent child being born alive or to cause to die after birth. So, whoever before the birth of any child does any act with the intention of thereby preventing that child from being born alive or causing it to die after its birth and does by such act prevent that child from being born alive or causes it to die after its birth shall if such act be not caused in good faith for the purpose of saving the life of the mother, be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years or with life or with both. But there is an exception here what it says, if the act is caused in is done in good faith for the purpose of saving the life of the mother, then it would not be punishable but it would be punishable if it was not done in good faith and it was not done for the purpose of saving the life of the mother then it would attract punishment under section 91. Then causing death of quick unborn child by act amounting to culpable homicide. So what section 92 says is whoever does any act under such circumstances that if he thereby caused death he would be guilty of culpable homicide and does by such act cause the death of a quick unborn child shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. So what is required is that the act by which death has been caused it should be an act that would tantamount to culpable homicide also. Now what amounts to culpable homicide we will discuss in detail in the next lecture.
there is an illustration appended to this section what it reads is a knowing that he is likely to cause the death of a pregnant woman does an act which if it caused the death of a woman would amount to culpable homicide. The woman is injured but does not die but the death of an unborn quick child with which she is pregnant is thereby caused A would be guilty of offence which is defined under this section. Section 93 it talks about exposure and abandonment of child under 12 years of age by parent or person having care of it. So you see when a child is dependent upon some person whether it is the parent whether it is any person who was placed in charge of the child and given the responsibility of taking care of the child and if such a person exposes the child to any such risk as to cause the death of the child or abandons the child then it would be something which would be punishable under section 93. What it says whoever being the father or mother of a child under the age of 12 years or having the care of such child shall expose or leave such child in any place with the intention of wholly abandoning such child shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 7 years or with fine or with both. Explanation clarifies that this section is not intended to prevent the trial of offence for murder or culpable homicide as the case may be if the child dies in consequence of the exposure. So you see mere exposure of child to such perilous circumstances and abandonment of the child would amount to an offence under section 93 but if it results in the death of the child then the accused can also be tried for culpable homicide or murder. Next is concealment of birth by secret disposal of dead body. So whoever by secretly burying or otherwise disposing of the dead body of a child whether such child dies before or after or during its birth intentionally conceals or endeavours to conceal the birth of such child shall be punished with imprisonment of for either description for a term which may extend to 2 years or with fine or with both. Then hiring, employing or engaging a child to commit an offence. See we have the Juvenile Justice Act as per which children they are to be sentenced to a lesser punishment as compared to adults the punishment that is given to adults for the same crime and that is the reason that we are increasingly seeing a large number of juveniles a large number of children being employed or engaged by gangs to commit crimes okay so here the act of hiring, employing or engaging a child to commit an offence is an offence in itself. Now this is a new provision that has been introduced in the BNS, it was not earlier there in the IPC. What does the law say? Whoever hires, employs or engages any child to commit an offence shall be punished with imprisonment of either description which shall not be less than 3 years but which may extend to 10 years and with fine and if the offence be committed shall also be punished with the punishment provided for that offence as if the offence had been committed by such person himself. So the mere act of hiring, employing or engaging a child is punishable and if the child has actually committed the crime then the same punishment would be given to the uh, person who had hired, engaged or employed the child. The child might be let off with a lesser punishment but the accused will, the man who has engaged or hired such a child would be entitled to the full punishment that is prescribed under the law. Then explanation, hiring, employing, engaging or using a child for sexual exploitation or pornography is covered within the meaning of this section. This is also covered under provisions of the POCSO. Then there are certain other provisions also which we will discuss in very brief like section 63 which deals with procuration of a child with intent that the child will be forced or seduced to illicit intercourse or when there is kidnapping or abducting of a child under 10 years of age with intent to steal from its person. So whoever kidnaps or abducts any child under the age of 10 years with intent of taking dishonestly any movable property from the person of such child. So there is a punishment which has been prescribed up to 7 years, anyone who sells a child for the purposes of prostitution, so whoever sells lets to hire or otherwise disposes of any child with intent 
that such child shall, shall at any age be employed or used for the purpose of prostitution or illicit intercourse with any person or for any law, unlawful and immoral purpose or knowing it to be likely that such child will at any age be employed or used for any such purpose shall be punished with imprisonment up to 10 years. There are two explanations also to section 98. Explanation 1 deals with women under the age of 18 years who are sold, let for hire or otherwise disposed of to a prostitute or to any person who keeps or manages a brothel. Then the person so disposing of such female shall until the contrary is proved be presumed to have disposed her with the intent that she shall be used for the purpose of prostitution. And explanation 2 defines illicit intercourse to mean sexual intercourse between persons who are not united by marriage or by any union or tie which though not amounting to a marriage is recognized by the personal law or custom of the, of the community to which they belong or where they belong to different communities of both such communities as constituting between them a quasi marital relationship. Then buying ch uh, child for purposes of prostitution, earlier we were talking about selling children for purpose of prostitution, section 99 makes even the act of buying a child for purpose of prostitution uh, as a crime and here the explanation is any prostitute or person keeping or managing a brothel who buys, hires or otherwise obtains possession of a female under the age of 18 years shall until the contrary is proved be presumed to have obtained possession of such female with intent that she shall be used for the purpose of prostitution. So this is a deeming provision. So if there is someone who has obtained a prostitute or a person who manages a brothel, if they have procured a girl below 18 years of age, so there is a deeming provision which presumes that you have procured with intent to push this girl into prostitution only. Again the explanation clarifies that illicit intercourse shall have the same meaning as given under section 98. So students, in this lesson we dealt with different offences that are committed against women and children and also offences that women are subjected to within the institution of marriage such as cruelty and dowry death. Hope you uh, enjoyed this lecture and hope the concepts are clear to you. Thank you.